So the whole earth was starting to be overrun with polytheism and the idea of godhood was degraded in the minds of men. Time for some good news. God didn't just sit back and let the whole thing spiral out of control. Instead he set in motion a plan to reveal himself to the world. And just as the beginning of the world began with one man in Adam and the beginning of the post-flood world began in one man through Noah, the beginning of this plan of redemption began with another solitary figure called Abraham. It was through Noah's son Ham that Nimrod was born, but it was through the lineage of another of his three sons, Shem, that we find Abraham's lineage. The Lord called Abraham, saying, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. God goes on to say in Genesis 18:19, I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. God's plan was to create a group of people, a nation, that would belong to him in the midst of the world that had fallen prey to the satanic mystery Babylon system. This nation would become Israel and these people would become known as the Jews, and through this single group, he would execute his stunning plan for the redemption of the world. He would reveal himself to them so that he could reveal himself through them to the rest of the world. The Old Testament is the story of how God revealed himself to them. It's the story of God introducing himself to his people, teaching them his character, what he wants from them, how they should think of him and refer to him. Like most relationships, it has a lot of ups and downs along the way, but the whole story has been faithfully recorded that the rest of us might also read about and know God for ourselves through their efforts and mistakes. Consequently, we can on that alone agree that all the families of the earth truly have been blessed through the Jews as promised in Genesis 12one to 3 the culmination of God's master plan would be Jesus, the glorious Messiah prophesied about in Genesis 3, the one who would crush the serpent's head. His death and resurrection was the decisive blow in the war with Satan, but it all began with one faithful man, Abraham. It wasn't that Abraham was especially righteous. In fact, he had a pagan background like most other people, but God can use anyone for his purposes. In fact, inadequacy almost helps because it causes men to rely on God when they might otherwise be tempted to rely on themselves. Abraham received the promise that he would be the beginning of a great nation when he was already around 75 years old. Sarah was barren and they were childless. Humanly speaking, what God was promising was impossible. Abraham's faith faltered as he just couldn't see how it would be possible for him to become the father of any child, let alone one that would be so important. Sarah suggested that they could force the issue in their own strength, without God, by having a son with their Egyptian slave girl Hagar instead. Abraham did this and the son was called Ishmael. However, this child that had come about from their own human efforts was not the one God had promised. Instead, even later in life, Sarah eventually miraculously conceived. This child of the promise was called Isaac and it was through him that the Jewish nation came to be. Isaac then had a son called Jacob, and this is why God is thereafter regularly referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are following this lineage to make it distinct from the lineage that came from his other son, Ishmael. However, because Ishmael was also a child of Abraham, God promised that he would turn him into a great nation too. Ishmael is the first of the people group we now know as the Arabs. God said, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, but I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. The rest of the Old Testament is basically the story of this nation that became known as Israel, this people group that became known as the Jews, and how they stood alone as God's people in a world full of mystery Babylon religion manifested as polytheism, sorcery and astrology. They were often persecuted, attacked, enslaved, driven out from their land, but God revealed himself to them and through them to the world. They keep losing faith in him and God keeps showing them that they can trust him. They turn their back on him and God chases after them. As we move through the Old Testament years, we will see evidence of this. Incidentally, the fact that Isaac replaced the firstborn Ishmael as the favoured son is a spiritual root for the Arabs' hatred of the Jews. 
As descendants of Ishmael, the Islamic world retains the same bitterness and animosity toward Israel as Ishmael had towards Isaac. As we fast forward from Abraham past Isaac and past Jacob, we get to Jacob's son Joseph, and you will no doubt know his famous story. The youngest brother in the family, he was beaten and sold into slavery by his older brothers. Many years of slavery, false accusation and imprisonment later, he ended up in Egypt where he becomes second in command to Pharaoh, the Egyptian prime minister. He was later reconciled with his brothers and the whole family moved to Egypt to be with him there. It is while there in Egypt that the Jewish people really began to multiply. The Bible describes it like this. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. So just seventy went to Egypt, but before long they were multiplying and filling the land. After some four hundred years of multiplication, the memory of Joseph and that generation disappeared, and the Egyptian pharaoh began to fear that the Jews were becoming too numerous. He regarded them as a threat to national security, and imagined that if they were ever to make war against their hosts, it would cause a big problem. From this paranoia, he decided to oppress them with forced labour, with the idea of keeping the numbers down. However, they continued to multiply and prosper even under these terms, to such a degree that Pharaoh took more drastic action, enslaving them and subjugating them under Egyptian rule. Again, to try and keep their numbers down, he commanded that all Jewish boys be killed the moment they are born. At this point, God stepped in by calling Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, through the desert, and into the freedom of a promised land flowing with milk and honey. Pharaoh, as you'll know, dug his heels in and refused to let God's people go. In response to this stubbornness, God sent ten plagues. Now lest you think we're getting off track here, it's important to realise that these plagues were not arbitrary. They were in fact direct attacks on the false gods that had originated in Babylon.